Some of you may have not seen the trailer or would just like to see it again, so I'll play the entire trailer through and then I'll come back to give my breakdown of the trailer. Show me the one whose safety deemed such destruction. You must reunite it with its own kind. Where? This you must determine. The songs of eons past tell of battles between Mandalore the Great and an order of sorcerers called Jedi. You expect me to search the galaxy and deliver this creature to a race of enemy sorcerers? This is the way. You know this is no place for a child. So now I'll break down the trailer, pausing during the various scenes and pointing things out. I want to reiterate what I have said in many of my videos. I don't hate The Mandalorian or The Mandalorian Show. If you turn off your brain and you just watch it as a show, it's fun. On the other side of the coin, if you're someone like me that has been a Star Wars fan since 1977 and you understand this world, the way that things work, and you have a vast Star Wars knowledge, this show has many, many problems. It breaks lore. It also has a tremendous amount of production problems. With that said, I don't want the show to fail. I truly, like most of us, want the show to get good, and I want us to have Star Wars back. But going by Disney and Lucasfilm's track record, and what we saw in Season 1, I'm not very optimistic. So I'm going to break down the things that I found throughout this trailer. I also want to mention that I watched roughly a dozen other people's reactions to this, just so that I could bounce off of what they were saying and hear what they thought about it. It's very interesting what a lot of people think they saw in this trailer. So let's break down this trailer. First, I can't tell you how many people in their reaction said, Oh look, this is Venus and that's the Earth. Have you watched Star Wars? This is in a galaxy, not just far, but a galaxy far, far away. No, this is not Earth, and it's most certainly not Venus. And if you know anything about our solar system, they are not within eyeshot of each other either. See the razor crest come into the screen. The first thing you can notice is it's pretty dirty. The side hatch is open, and the rear hatch is very much open. Now, Star Wars is its own galaxy, but most normal space rules apply. It is a vacuum. This is further proven by The Last Jedi when Leia gets blown out into space. Everything gets sucked out. So the first problem here is if these hatches, even just the rear hatch is open, this ship would crumple within itself. The vacuum would make this ship crumple like a can. Second, Mando and Baby Yoda would have not only been sucked out, but dead because now there's no atmosphere. We will give it one saving grace they can argue that the cockpit is sealed off from the rest of the ship. I'll let that slide. But as far as this rear section should have first of all been crumpled, but outside of that, everything in this ship would have been sucked out into space. As I'm sure we're going to see the inside of the Razor Crest at some point in Season 2, note that if you see a single weapon, wire, hose, item, carbonite block, anything inside of this ship, they have just broken their own lore and their own logic because everything would have been sucked out of this ship. It must be completely bare inside. And I mean completely. Every last knob, everything that is not hinged down, bolted down, would have to fly out of this ship. 
you can see sparks coming off. You can see there's smoke, which there would be no smoke in space, but okay, there's smoke and it's flying kind of sideways. While this is not necessarily the very first part of season two, this is the first thing they're showing you of season two in the trailer. So right from the get-go, they are reestablishing that the Mando is constantly in problems, constantly failing, constantly in trouble. His ship, which was all rebuilt and fixed, is now once again all destroyed and damaged. For being the best bounty hunter in the Parsec, he constantly is having massive problems. And they show that from the beginning. He doesn't have to be perfect, but the best bounty hunter in the Parsec is constantly getting his butt whooped all over the place. And the first thing we see is his ship just destroyed to hell. Show me the one safety deemed such While it is not totally clear this could be a building, this also could possibly be a statue. Again, I am speculating here. These look like they may be buildings or sections of buildings, the lower sections. That almost looks like it could be broken off. This very much looks like a Sith or Jedi statue. Again, this is pure speculation. I have no proof or indication that this is Coruscant, only that there is some city in the background and that that may or may not be a statue. It also could just be a building or a piece of debris. It is possible that he'll go to Coruscant because he's supposedly going to bounce around the galaxy trying to find Yoda's parents. Destruction. must reunite it with its own kind. I want you to listen closely to the dialogue of the armorer speaking. Where? This you must determine. A lot of people in their reactions are like, oh my god, the armorer is speaking and she's talking about what he needs to do in the Jedi. This isn't new dialogue. This is literally from chapter 8 of season 1. So it's kind of weird to me that people are all shocked that they're hearing the same dialogue from season 1. Weren't you paying attention during season one? If you look here, there's other tall buildings and there's graffiti everywhere. This again could be anywhere, but it's not impossible that this is a level of Coruscant and maybe even 1313, which was not only where the Mandalorian show comes from, but it was also featured in the Clone Wars cartoon. So it's not impossible that this is 1313 or some area or level of Coruscant. You must reunite it with its own kind. Where? This you must determine. Here we see a desert planet, a Bantha, and a Tusken Raider. Very cool. I think the Bantha looks great. The Tusken Raider looks right on point. I think it looks very good. I have no complaints here at all. This is much better than the Mudhorn nonsense paper mache creature they made in Season 1. A lot of people directly assume, Oh my god, it's Tatooine! No, you cannot assume that. Jawas were always native to Tatooine. In Mandalorian, we saw them on Arvala 7, which was Quill's planet. So this literally could be any planet, because apparently we're going to have species on different planets that they were not on originally. Remember to listen closely to what the armorer is saying. This you must determine. The Here we have a snow planet. There has been no direct reference to the Empire Strikes Back for the Mandalorian. What Filoni and Favreau did say is that you can expect this season to be better than the last season, just like Empire was to Star Wars. It's going to be bigger and better. But at no point did they indicate that this has anything to do with Empire or any kind of relation to Empire. Could this be Hoth? Well, it's not impossible, but I wouldn't assume so. My initial reaction is that this must be Ilum. Ilum was first seen in the Gendi Tartakovsky Clone Wars. This is the planet where the Jedi go to get their crystals for their lightsabers. Ilum is also the planet that gets terraformed by the First Order and turned into Starkiller Base. When you see Starkiller Base, that is Ilum. It would somewhat make sense that this would be Ilum as Mando is looking for Yoda's parents. That would relate to Jedi. Therefore, if he got some wind of Ilum being related to the Jedi, he could go to investigate there to try to track down some sort of trail for finding Baby Yoda's parents. Songs of Eon's past tell of battles between Mandalore the Great and an order of sorcerers. These are Quarren. We saw them in Star Wars and throughout the movies. We saw them in the Clone Wars cartoon, and we also saw them in The Mandalorian Season 1. In particular, Chapter 1, The Bar Fight. This is a water planet with some sort of a wharf or harbor. We can 
probably assume, as there are so many Quarren, and that this is a water planet, that they are on Mon Calamari. The planet was originally called Mon Calamari, it then became Mon Cala. The species are what are Mon Calamari. There are the Quarren, and there's the Mon Calamari, which is Admiral Akbar's species. They live in unison, Mon Calamari and the Quarren, on Mon Cala, an ocean planet. The planet is all water. There are underwater cities, but there are also cities on the surface of the planet. There are a few other species, but as you can see, just about everyone is a Quarren. Now pay attention to this area, which they will also zoom into. Is called Jedi. Also notice, Mando does not have Baby Yoda in his hands. Granted, Baby Yoda could be here on the ground walking, but would you be walking in some strange place with all this activity and people you don't know, with Baby Yoda just toddling along? No, he should be in his hands or hidden in a pouch or whatever. Instead, you see that he's not even here or that he's down here walking, which is not smart at all. Jedi. Here we see someone in a hood. This is indeed Sasha Banks. If you look at her face closely and you go do a Google search for Sasha Banks, that is Sasha Banks. Some people were getting all excited. Rosario Dawson, that does not look anything like Rosario Dawson. Check your eyes. And that is most certainly not Ahsoka Tano because she doesn't have paint all over her face. This potentially could be a few people. She could be a Jedi as she is in robes. Barisafi and Luminara Indali both use dark Jedi robes, so it is not impossible that she is a Jedi. It is also possible that she is a Sith, or if not a Sith, a dark side force user, which is what I would think. The way that she's peering at them and then disappears, I would assume that she's someone tracking them. She could be a Jedi, she could be a dark Jedi, or she could also just be someone in a robe. Although we know that generally people in robes are Jedi, or Force users. Now it is also possible that this is Sabine Wren. She has the correct skin tone, we don't see her hair, and we don't know if it's long. So it is possible that under here she has colorful hair. It is also ironic because Sabine Wren, her stats are, she's 5'5", 114 pounds. Sasha Banks is literally 5'5", and 114 pounds. Because of her vital stats, I'm thinking that this might be Sabine Wren. Of course, we have no direct indication or proof, but it certainly fits that it could be her. Just remember that Sabine is a Mandalore, not a Jedi, so for her to be in this type of robe is a little bit strange, but, you know, someone just moving around the galaxy trying to be inconspicuous could potentially be in robes. Anyways, this is without a doubt, if you look at the face, Sasha Banks. She's here, and in a moment you're going to see she disappears. Here you get a better look at her face. That is absolutely 10,000% Sasha Banks. You expect me to search the galaxy and deliver this creature to a race of enemy sorcerers? You can see she's disappeared. That doesn't necessarily mean she's a Jedi or a Force user. She could have just stepped away, but they're implying that with not only the dialogue, but her action. I'm going to let it play through so you can listen to the dialogue carefully of battles between Mandalore the Great and an order of sorcerers called Jedi. You expect me to search the galaxy and deliver this creature to a race of enemy sorcerers? This is the way. So now Baby Yoda in his little pram or bassinet is next to Mandalorian floating. That's fine, but just a moment ago, we saw Mando walking and he wasn't there. So either there was some other production problem that they missed that, or he's floating behind him, which again brings up the problem. Why aren't you keeping an eye on this baby? Anybody could walk up behind you and snatch that baby. The Armorer's Dialogue is from Season 1, where she's talking about the magical wizards. And Mandalorian is saying, you expect me to find these wizards and turn the baby over to them. And she says, this is the way. The Mandalorian. While we do not have an exact date of his birthday, was born prior to 19 BBY. That is the end of the Clone Wars. The Clone Wars were 22 BBY to 19 BBY. Three years. He was born prior to the end of the Clone Wars. So when Anakin is attacking the Jedi Temple, all the Jedis get purged in Order 66. Right around that time, or just before it, the Mandalorian is born. You can see in Season 1 that he's a small child and there's super battle droids there. The Mandalorian would have not only been aware of the Clone Wars, but what's going on in the world. You compound that by he's a Mandalorian. Mandalorians are very cunning mercenaries, bounty hunters, fighters. 
They have a very vast knowledge of the Star Wars galaxy. They were part of the Great Sith War. Mandalorians are 4,000 years old. Also, as a teenager, or at least young man, the Mandalorian would have been around when the Galactic Civil War was going on. When the Empire was ruling over the galaxy, when if most people didn't know the Emperor, they certainly knew Darth Vader and that he was terrorizing everyone and killing people and destroying entire planets. He would have been well aware when Luke blew up the first Death Star. So many would have heard the story of Luke Skywalker spread through the entire galaxy because the entire galaxy was under the oppression of the Emperor and the Galactic Empire. So for Mandalorian in Season 1 and now again in Season 2 to not know who the Jedi are is absolutely ridiculous. If you were some off-world nobody, maybe. But you're a Mandalorian flying around major planets and cities. You are interacting with all kinds of species and people. You would have been brought up with knowledge of the galaxy. How do you not know what a Jedi is? This also causes a problem. In Star Wars, it's called A New Hope. Luke Skywalker is the New Hope. Luke Skywalker is the only Jedi. By the middle of The Empire Strikes Back, and definitely by Return of the Jedi, Luke Skywalker is the last Jedi alive. He is the last possible hope of saving the galaxy. Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi are dead. Luke is the last Jedi. Jedi. Not only is he the only Jedi, but his story would have traveled all throughout the galaxy because he literally saved everyone from the Empire. For Mandalorian to not know who Luke Skywalker is and the Jedi in general is just ridiculous. So this leads to two routes. Either Luke Skywalker is going to have to be in the show because he's the only Jedi. He does in the EU reestablish the Jedi Order, but within five years after Jedi that the Mandalorian takes place, how many established Jedi is Luke Skywalker going to have? Very few. So either we have to see a younger Luke, which causes problems because later Luke hates everything and is just an angry hermit. It doesn't line up. Or we have someone like Ahsoka Tano going to come in. Ahsoka Tano is supposed to be dead before Order 66. This is from George Lucas. Dave Filoni couldn't let Ahsoka go. He kept her alive, and now she's a problem. Because if Ahsoka was alive, did she just sit around and hide throughout episodes 4, 5, and 6? Why didn't she seek out Luke Skywalker? Why didn't she seek out the twins, or Obi-Wan, or Yoda? She knows Yoda and Obi-Wan. She never contacted them. She never sought them out. She never joined the fight to help Luke Skywalker. No, because she doesn't exist. She's long dead. Luke Skywalker is the new hope. Luke Skywalker saves the galaxy. Luke Skywalker is the last and only Jedi. So having any Jedi in this show is a major problem. Here we're on the same planet. As you can see, it's the water. So most likely this is Mon Cala. Here is a ship on the water. A lot of people's trailer reactions are saying, Oh my God, the first time we see a boat. No, it's not the first time we see a boat. In Attack of the Clones, we see Padme and Anakin on a little boat on Naboo. In The Last Jedi, Canto Bite, we see a massive yacht in the water. Then that yacht continues to go straight off a cliff, and then it begins to fly. But it is in the water as a yacht first. And in Rise of Skywalker, we see Mary Sue Ray, who grew up on a desert planet, now taking on massive waves in a small boat going towards the Death Star. So this is not at all the first time we have seen boats. As you can see, Mando's there with Baby Yoda. There was a horn there in the background. This is that ship. Here we have a scene of Mando with some X-Wings. Many have been saying, oh, the X-Wings are escorting Mando. No, that is not what I see here. What I see is just like in Cloud City, the security patrol pulls up next to the Millennium Falcon and is hailing them and warning them, hey, you need to comply or we're going to shoot you down. And that is what is happening here. The X-Wings are not escorting him. They are coming up to him, hailing him and saying, hey, what is your business? What are you up to? They may or may not know about Baby Yoda. We don't know here. But this is a conflict. This is not an escort. This is further confirmed by the S-Foils are going to open into attack position. And then right after that, Mando is being chased by the X-Wings. Here we're on a desert planet. This could be Navarro, it could be Arvala 7, it could be Tatooine, it could be a whole new planet, who knows. 
left, as you can see, these two are here, and this appears to be Navarro. Navarro looks a little bit cleaned up, a little bit better state. Their clothing looks a little bit cleaner, and Grief Karga's outfit looks just a little bit more fancy, so perhaps he's prosperous with Cara Dune helping him out with bounties on and from Navarro. It has been mentioned in different news releases that these two are working together as a team and that we're going to see them more together, so that makes sense. Here we see these new style TIE Fighters with the wings that fold up and they land. I don't have any problem with them, they are very cool. However, if the Empire was just disbanded, the Emperor is dead, Darth Vader is dead, how does the Empire have resources and how is the Empire continuing to develop new TIE Fighters? Yes, this is further into the future in the timeline, so technology would improve, but the Empire is in disarray. In Season 1, the Mandalorian says that the Empire is gone, they're not even around, which again makes him look foolish, because we all know that the Empire didn't just disappear because the Death Star was blown up. They're still around, there's still Star Destroyers and TIE Fighters, but it is questionable that they're now developing these new TIE Fighter designs when the Empire is in shambles. They're spread out, they're disorganized, they have no leadership. For them to be building these new ships just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. This is eye candy. I think they are very cool, but it doesn't make sense. Here we hear the famous Imperial Alarm, and we see stormtroopers running through a corridor. John Carlos Esposito, that plays Moff Gideon, has said that he is going to be on a very large ship. We already knew it was going to be a Star Destroyer, and here you go. So apparently some of the Star Destroyers are still around, which makes sense. The Empire is still around, which makes sense. But what doesn't make sense is that the Mandalorian acts like he knows nothing about the Jedi and nothing about the Empire, when the rest of us all know that they both exist. Here we see scout troopers jumping off of a platform. If you look closely when they land, there are some streaks of lava. That means that it's possibly Navarro, which makes sense because they were there and we saw lava on Navarro. But that also opens the door to potentially Mustafar. In The Rise of Skywalker, the beginning, Kylo Ren is on Mustafar, which is all ashed over. It's not a lava flowing planet like it was in the prequels. So it is not impossible that this is Mustafar, although I would assume that this is Navarro. Here you see the scout trooper turning and he puts his leg down as you instinctively would on a motorcycle. While we have never really seen the speeder bikes turning, one would assume, as this is modern technology, that the speeder bike has all kinds of stabilizers on it. You wouldn't have to put your leg down to balance. He should be able to just make the turn. It's not a big problem, but it's like they're trying to associate it too much to Earth, to our technology and our ways of acting. And this is Star Wars. It's not necessarily the same. Again, this is a very small thing, but I just feel like it's very much out of place that he's putting his leg out as if to balance for the turn. If you look here, there's a stripe of lava. Most likely, this is Navarro. No, this is no. The next scene, we see Mando is in some sort of sewer and he comes up under a grate. This could be anywhere or anything, possibly back on Moncala, who knows. It could also be a sewer somewhere in Coruscant, potentially. You will see him grab the grate and he pops up out of the water. Place for a child. There, we saw him about to take off with his jetpack. Hopefully, we'll see him using his jetpack more, as Mandalorians do. Here again, the graffiti. We have no idea where this is, but it is possible that this is a level of Coruscant. We're unable to really tell who this is. It's just someone hung upside down and why he blast that. No idea. Here you can see this droid. This was in Chapter 1 of The Mandalorian in the bar. If you haven't noticed before, this is a throwback to Doctor Who. Here we're back on an ice planet. Again, this is probably Ilum. As you can see, he's starting to go into the caverns, which would make sense. That's where the Jedi crystals are. Not that he would have any interest in the lightsaber crystal, but perhaps he's trying to trail down some Jedi. Wherever I go, he goes. Wherever I go, he goes. Oh, really? How about in Chapter 2 when you ran off after the Sandcrawler and left Baby Yoda? How about when you landed on Tatooine and you left Baby Yoda inside the ship while some random mechanic that you have no idea who it is is working on your ship, and then you come back and she's babysitting Baby Yoda. How about on the prison ship, when you have all those thugs on your ship, and you leave Baby Yoda hidden inside of the ship, who later gets discovered and almost killed by that droid.
Here we see two Gamorreans that are in an arena fighting. They have the axe, they have the pig face. The problem with this is that the average Gamorrean is 5'9 and 220 pounds. Dave Filoni, have you watched Return of the Jedi? Up until this moment, all Gamorreans are those chubby pigs. Now one could argue that in Jabba's palace, they're hanging around and eating and getting fat. But with Jabba, the most notorious gangster in the Outer Rim that controls several planets and has massive influence to the point of the Empire has to negotiate with him, have schlubby guards in his chamber? No, he's going to have the best of the best around him to protect him, including Boba Fett. To presume that some Gamorreans are thinner because they work out or fight is incorrect because they are the chubby pig species. It's not that those are out of shape, it's that's what they look like. And Filoni is now again changing lore and changing what Gamorreans look like. You're now going to see a Cyclops type character talking to Mandalorian in the next shot. If you listen closely, I think that's Jon Favreau's voice. So I've heard. All these guys all of a sudden pop up. Naturally, they want Baby Yoda or, for whatever reason, Mando. Beskar Steel deflects lightsabers and blasters. What are you guys going to do by shooting that helmet? Absolutely nothing. On the contrary, the blaster bolt might just bounce right back off and kill you for shooting him. Doesn't make any sense. Why aren't you pointing the blaster at his neck, at his throat, at his back, at his leg? Doing this does nothing. Furthermore, just take his damn helmet off. There's nothing holding the helmet. It would make him vulnerable and expose his identity. What is this going to do? Absolutely nothing. In any event, this arena appears to be at least somewhat crowded. There's got to be other people watching the show, and you can listen to the sound that there's people observing the fight. Mando now has a restock of whistling birds. Which is fine because at the end of season one, he meets up with the armor, she gives him the backpack and all kinds of new supplies, and he would have gotten some more whistling birds. So that's fine. This is a very cool shot, and it's the best part of the entire trailer. I always give credit where credit is due, and this is very cute and very cool. So you hear sounds and it goes black. I would assume that in the show we're going to physically see those thugs get hit by the whistling birds and you hear some metal clang so he probably punches someone or does whatever. Hopefully they do show it. Part of what you hear is probably Mando taking this guy and or this guy out and then he throws his knife, which we assume is a vibroblade, into this guy's heart. Notice that the entire arena is empty. There's no one in the ring, there's no one around on the bleachers, not even the guys that he supposedly just killed. Potentially, when the thugs pull the guns on Mando, and or when he launches the whistling birds, it's possible that everybody runs out of the arena. But it just seems very strange that one moment he's in an arena with people watching, and now it's this empty place. This guy is a Zabrak, the species of Darth Maul. You can tell by his horns and his body type, that's a Zabrak. So this is perfectly fine. He got him right in the heart. The blade is all the way in. Totally makes sense. It's cool. As opposed to chapter two of season one, where he barely put the blade into the neck of the mudhorn and killed that massive creature. Didn't make any sense. This at least does make sense. He got him right in the heart, assuming his heart is even there or that he has a heart. For all you know, his heart is in his stomach or somewhere else. But we can buy that the blade going all the way into his chest killed him. No problem. This is the way. There's the season two trailer. It's coming out as they have already announced October 30th on Disney Plus. Overall, I am not hyped up for The Mandalorian. I've saw many reactions and everybody's jumping around in their seats like this is the greatest thing they've seen, which is very concerning. If this is what you are going to consider the level of Star Wars, then that's what we're going to get. This is why we got the sequel trilogy, because you guys get excited over nonsense. This show is good. It is not great. It has many problems and it should be much better. This is 2020 with multi-million dollar budgets. 40 plus years of lore and technology. This show should be much, much better. Again, if you just watch it as a casual fan or someone that doesn't even know Star Wars, or you just turn off your brain and let everything go, it is a fun show. I'm not trying to trash it. This show has problems as the trailer is showing. 
Several questions come up with this show and trailer, so let's take a look at a galaxy map. This is an older map, but it will give us a good idea of the layout of the galaxy. So for example, here is Exegol, where the Emperor is in The Rise of Skywalker. Here is Ilum, the original planet where the Jedi would get the crystals and that was later turned into Starkiller Base. Kuat, that is where most of the ships in the galaxy are built. Here's the famous Jakku. Here's Jedha. Here's Alderaan. Alderaan and Coruscant, as you can see, are very much here in the center of the galaxy. Here's Felucia. Dathomir, which is Darth Maul's planet. Here's Mon Calamari, which is later becomes Moncala. Kessel, the Kessel Run. Here's Kamino, where the clones are made. Here's Tatooine. Naboo. Dakar. Krait from The Last Jedi. Dagobah, Yoda's home. Mustafar, Vader's palace. Bespin, Cloud City. Also, right next to it is Hoth. Bakara from the books. Batu, which is Galaxy's Edge. Octo, which is Luke's Island. Takodana, the beginning of The Force Awakens. Endor, or that we all know, the Ewoks. Hosnian Prime is where the Republic is blown up in The Force Awakens by Starkiller Base, the Five Planets, Hosnian Prime. So the reason I'm showing you this is so that you get a scope of the size of the galaxy. Navarro and some of the other planets are Vala 7, mostly stuff from Mandalorian, but also from Disney era is not all here. Which brings up a point that on StarWars.com, they do not have a timeline and they don't have a galaxy map. I don't know what's going on over at Disney, but how do you not have not only a current timeline and map, but you don't even have either on the site. The point I'm trying to make here is if we see him on Tatooine, and we see him potentially on Mustafar, we see him potentially on Ilum, we see him potentially on Mon Cala, do you see how he is all over the galaxy? The amount of time to travel this expanse of space would be weeks, days, a lot of time. Also understand that hyperspace isn't just, well, I'm here and I want to go here, so I just jump. That's not how it works. There are hyperspace lanes, as you can see here. That is why Exegol was in the Forbidden Territory and could not be found. Same with Acto, because you had to take specific hyperspace jumps to even get to Exegol. You couldn't do one jump. You would have to do several independent jumps. Same thing to Acto. This outer region is very unexplored and difficult to get to. There are main lanes throughout the center of the galaxy, and there are some branches. But you can't just from Korriban go straight to Batu. That's not how it works. You have to go to the main lanes, come across and down, and then come out of hyperspace and fly across. Now you could, for example, come down to this area, cut across here with another jump, and you would be much closer. But just know that hyperspace isn't just jumping to wherever you want. There are lanes that are charted out. Why? Because there's planets and debris and suns and all kinds of things in the path. You can't just take a path that you want. Just like Han Solo says, you have to use the Navi computer or you could end up in the middle of a star or moon or whatever. So proposing that Mando is jumping around Tatooine, Mon Cala, Ilum, assuming that these are the correct planets, Coruscant, He's all over this galaxy. Just the amount of time traveling would be tremendous. Not to mention his ship is constantly under problems. He's apparently got problems with the Empire. He's got problems with the Rebellion as well. What about the tracking fobs? Are they going to explain them? Are they still going to exist? Or are they just going to step over that and pretend like they never existed? So assuming there's tracking fobs, you got people chasing him all over the place. It simply does not make sense that the Mandalorian is traveling all over the galaxy within short amounts of time. Here's a bit of a newer map from Disney, although it's not completely updated, but this was made around the time of Galaxy's Edge to be able to justify Batu. You see the distance from Batu to Mustafar is a massive amount of travel. Gamor, where the Gamorian guards are from. Toidaria, where Watto is from. Just from Batu 
to Hosnian Prime is a massive trip. Look at, you're going through several regions in the galaxy. So once again, if he's traveling from Tatooine to Ilum, which is Starkiller Base, that's literally all the way across the galaxy. Moncala, that's all the way across the galaxy. It doesn't add up, it doesn't line up. Links to these maps will be in the description. So that's about it for the Mandalorian Season 2 trailer. It does look like it will be fun, but if you take Star Wars seriously, if you have a knowledge of Star Wars, it just has massive problems. And it is frustrating because there's no need for these problems to exist if Dave Filoni is doing his job and paying attention. The first season was full of massive problems, and I am not very optimistic for season two. All the problems with The Mandalorian, Chapter 2, The Child, will be releasing in the next few days. I'm wrapping up the editing of that video, and you will continue to see that this show has massive, massive problems. I don't want to discourage anyone from the show. I will be watching it, and I hope that you enjoy it. It is fun to watch, but it is hard to swallow that this is the best that we're going to get. This is far from the standard of George Lucas' Star Wars. The show should be much better, and we can already see just from the trailer there are conflicting issues with this show. We'll see what happens on October 30th. I will also review all the problems with those chapters, bringing in Boba Fett and Sabine and Ahsoka and Rex, who's going to be 82 years old, just doesn't make sense. I will finish up with something that I was discussing in my last live stream just a few days ago. Did George Lucas have a plan for Star Wars? In that stream, I discuss how there is a rumor that there are issues in The Mandalorian, and that is why the trailer was delayed, because the trailer was supposed to come out about two weeks ago. They had to re-edit it to fix something in the trailer. What I had reported was further verified today by Grace Randolph. Grace is not the most knowledgeable in Star Wars, but generally her sources are right on point, so whenever she reports on those types of rumors, she is generally correct. The original rumor was that Pedro Pascal had some sort of issue with Lucasfilm, and they told him to walk off the set. So the re-edits were possibly reflecting either an issue with Ahsoka, or the fact that Pedro may have been kicked off the show. Grace further confirms that the specific problem was that Pedro Pascal wanted to be able to take his helmet off. He was arguing with some heads at Lucasfilm about, I want to show my face. This is normal for actors, they have a bit of ego, and of course, they want their face on the screen. I don't think that Pedro thought it through and realized that, hey, Dave Filoni says you're a Mandalorian, and they don't take off their helmets, although that in itself breaks lore, because Mandalorians have always taken off their helmets. Again, Dave Filoni messing up his own canon. So the issue was Pedro is wanting to take his mask off. I can understand that from the actor's ego angle, but also, as I had covered in my video, the Mandalorian isn't who you think he is. Pedro is hardly ever in the suit. It is the stunt doubles. I show several examples of evidence of this in that video. Furthermore, it is confirmed that the episode that Bryce Dallas Howard had filmed Pedro Pascal was not even on the set. She literally said that. He was off doing some theater work. So I think that Pedro is getting frustrated that he's barely in the suit, and worse yet, he never gets to show his face, and he knows that that word has gotten out, and he wants to be seen. Apparently, Lucasfilm, Favreau, and Filoni don't want him to be seen. So they had a clash and a conflict at Lucasfilm, and either he was told to walk off the set, or he walked off the set. There is a high probability, according to Grace Randolph, that the show, halfway through the season, switches over and it is now a different Mandalorian or a different character altogether. The show, The Mandalorian, is not even about The Mandalorian. It's about Baby Yoda, and apparently, Pedro is not even going to be in all of Season 2. If we go by the pattern of Season 1 trailer, the things that they showed us in that trailer were mostly clips of Chapters 1 and 2. They don't even show you too far ahead. So I'm going to assume that this trailer does the same, that they're showing you just the first few chapters of Season 2. So it is very likely that most of what you saw is all we get of Pedro, and then he's off the show. Again, this is the rumor, but Grace says that she has it confirmed by two sources, and she's usually right with this type of thing. We will have to wait to see the show, to see what happens. 
Both Favreau and Filoni have confirmed that this show is now going to go to a Game of Thrones style where they're going to explore different branches and different characters and that the world is going to open up much larger. So obviously it's not going to concentrate around the Mandalorian in his small bubble or world. It's going to expand on the Star Wars galaxy and go off into different stories. So it is very likely that Pedro is either off the show or been limited. We'll see what happens. I know that a lot of people are excited for this show, and I hope that you enjoy it. But me personally, as someone that has loved Star Wars from the beginning, this is not Star Wars. This is nowhere the level of what Star Wars can and should be. And if we go off of Disney's patterns with everything else Star Wars, and more specifically with what we saw in Season 1, I'm not overly optimistic for Season 2. We will find out on October 30th, and I will watch the entire season, and I will do a breakdown of all the chapters. See you then. Please like, subscribe, and comment on the video. May the Force be with you.